From the beginning of Halo's fictional mythos, John 117 has always been defined as someone who wins. King of the Hill on a playground was the shadow of the Gravemind's defeat, the Didact's containment, Eshram's breaking, and every other victory he stole from the bloodthirsty and cruel. And Sierra 117 knows this himself. He knows that his purpose is to win. Nevertheless, his legendary career does not exist without loss. In fact, many of the defining characteristics of John's life were catalyzed by loss. Given this relationship between winning and losing, John sustains a personal tension with certain losses, the ones that he couldn't accept. And yet, he managed to bring victory out of this tension by imparting a lesson that he himself hasn't learned to someone else. What was the worst day of his life? The fall of Reach? The death of Cortana? Her betrayal? Perhaps. But the worst war he fights is summarized by this question. How do you tell the difference between a life spent and a life wasted? A leader must be ready to send the soldiers under his command to their deaths, Mendez said without turning to face John. You do this because your duty to the UNSC supersedes your duty to yourself or even your crew. It is acceptable to spend their lives if necessary. It is not acceptable, however, to waste those lives. Do you understand the difference? I believe I understand, sir, John said. But which was it on this last mission? Lives spent or lives wasted? Chief Petty Officer Mendez provided no answer to this question. It stayed with John for a time. Nearly four dozen trainees were crippled or killed by the Spartan II program's augmentation procedures, and John was powerless to save them. Even so, as their squad leader, he believed that the fault was somehow his own. Months later, when Samuel 034's Mjolnir armor was compromised inside the starship Unrelenting in 2525, John excused his best friend to remain on board. The bombs that they had planted would grant him a far quicker death than the vacuum of space. While John and Kelly 087 escaped, Samuel died with the ship. His death gave John a piece of understanding. Sam's death had shown them that the Covenant were not invincible. They could be beaten. At a high cost, however. John finally understood what the Chief had meant, the difference between a life wasted and a life spent. John also knew that humanity had a fighting chance, and he was ready to go to war. Despite this surge of resolution, he later began to doubt himself. The decision continued to haunt John in his dreams, and that troubled him. He had seen many soldiers die, but Sam had been under his command, and John could not help believing that had he been better prepared, and not quite so reckless, his friend would be fighting at his side today. He never found a way that he could have averted Sam's death given the situation's sheer lack of options, but his doubts heavily influenced the way he led his team in their next EVA mission. He was determined not to lose another teammate needlessly. Throughout the roughly 30-year Human Covenant conflict and beyond, more than half of the remaining Spartan twos would die, some of them with great purpose, others by error, and most of them because of the overwhelming power of their enemy. And there were the countless deaths of unaugmented men and women that the Master Chief fought beside throughout his career. During the invasion of the planet Mesra in 2526, John and Blue Team coordinated with the local militia for the purpose of thwarting the Covenant's resource grab. The ground conflict lasted eight days, but the Spartans were present only for the final day. By this point, the Mesrani fighters were exhausted but unwaveringly bloodthirsty and made a tactical error in the final defensive operation that cost them all their lives. The Master Chief blamed himself for not convincing them to fight according to his recommendation, despite Kelly 087's correct reminder that John was not even in the same military and possessed no actual authority over them. All of these deaths weighed on him, but they didn't break him. In fact, when he received the smart AI Cortana for Operation Red Flag, he was initially concerned that she would not share his willingness to sacrifice anything necessary to fulfill his objective. As they worked together, however, he surprised himself by the way he grew to care for her. He valued not only every advantage that she afforded him on the battlefield, but also her company. Ironically, it was she who persuaded him to sacrifice something for the sake of humanity that he had not been prepared to let go of. 
his pride. When he and the other UNSC survivors of Alpha Halo took control of the Covenant flagship Ascendant Justice, his focus was on following the Spartans' original Red Flag directives. Find and hijack a Covenant vessel with which to enter enemy territory, then capture a profit for leverage in negotiating a peaceful end to the war. Thankfully, Cortana pointed out that the UNSC would be better served by bringing the captured starship's technology to Earth. However, even this late into the war, John's sense of mission priorities was static. If there were a possibility of completing his original mission, he naturally intended to take it. Nevertheless, as much as he didn't want to admit it, even John felt the temptation to stop and regroup before continuing. Deviating from his orders, regardless of the circumstances, was comparable to sin in his mind. But with a team of only a few exhausted standard humans, the chief, begrudgingly, chose to cede operational command to another member of their makeshift group. Eventually, the chief would pass this lesson on adaptability to the weapon. Something stopped your deletion. We need to find out why. But this wasn't the mission. The missions changed. They always do. Are you sure? Cortana also occasionally acted as a check on her partner's frame of mind. One strikingly relevant instance was a battle outside the silent cartographer on Alpha Halo, in which two marines who had been riding with the chief were killed by a hunter. The chief repaid the Megalet Golo in kind, but he blamed himself for failing to save the marines. Two more lives wasted. Although Cortana couldn't read John's mind, she promptly told him that he wasn't responsible. Her reassurance helped him clear his head in order to deal with the second hunter. In mid-2557, most of Cortana died with the mantle's approach, and John was again powerless, this time to save her. Their traumatic separation gave him the opportunity for deep introspection, which he avoided by taking mission after mission. When the specter of Cortana beckoned him to Meridian, however, he decided that no intervening directive would take priority over his finding her, after he completed his current mission, of course. This decision created a wave of uncertainty that would mature into regret, with the confirmation of Cortana's deception and betrayal. From that point on, even the mention of Cortana incited the same kind of obsessive thinking that had plagued John's mind following the death of Samuel 034. He could not help feeling responsible. Had he ordered Cortana to stand down when her rampancy began to accelerate, she would never have been drawn into the domain but he would never have destroyed that Forerunner weapon. While John acknowledged the lack of helpful alternatives to the actions he took, he was also mindful of where he went wrong, and how he would eventually have to pay for it. There had been no good choices in any event. John knew that. He had done the best he could under such terrible circumstances, right up until he disobeyed orders and went AWOL, and had to be doggedly hunted down by his superiors and fellow Spartans. Someday, there was going to be a reckoning for that decision. Contrast this mindset with Dr. Halsey's. Halsey had created Cortana. At least she had no misgivings about that part of her work. Had Cortana never been created, humanity would simply no longer exist. Without Cortana, the Monitor 343 Guilty Spark would have convinced him to activate Alpha Halo. Had Cortana not outwitted the monstrous grave mind a few months later, the parasitic flood would have spread throughout the galaxy and turned humanity into a collective of mindless ghouls. If Cortana had not been there to infiltrate the mantle's approach, the ancient forerunner known as the Didact would have composed the entire population of Earth, destroying their bodies and trapping their digital essences forever. Before going rampant, Cortana had saved humanity many times over. So. If it had now fallen to Halsey and Blue Team to liberate humanity from Cortana's despotism, she saw no reason to feel guilty. When it came down to it, the human race still existed to be liberated. Sierra 117 knew the difference between a life spent and a life wasted, but he didn't accept it. He doggedly believed the losses that most affected him could have been avoided. The destruction of Laconia Station, the annihilation of Doisac, and the second death of Cortana redoubled his sense of regret and self-blame. It's my fault. 
How? I should have stopped it. I could have reasoned with her. Could you? It was her choice, her programming. Was it? I don't know anymore. Upon his revival by the pilot Fernando Esparza in May of 2560, he determined to halt the systematized slaughter of UNSC survivors on Zeta Halo and find closure for the fate of Cortana. He worked his way persistently through the banished and forerunner defenses, putting down every enemy in his path with the help of an increasingly exasperated Esparza. After the pilot's pelican was shot down by banished anti-aircraft cannons while traveling from one of the ring's reformation spires to another, the chief was confronted by this frustrated and fearful man. Esparza wanted to find a slipspace-capable condor in the surrounding ship graveyard, but the chief logically insisted on destroying the AA guns. Esparza relented for the moment, but became increasingly anxious as Eshram's Spartan killers advertised their imminent arrival. Spartan. I know you can hear me. Will you die with honor? They're sending a Spartan killer? <sighs> Chief, this is crazy. This is crazy. We gotta get out of here. We've gotta move. Not yet. After the Master Chief had destroyed the final anti-aircraft cannon, the pilot decided to evacuate his pelican in favor of an inconspicuous condor. The Chief put down the Spartan killers and went to find the pilot, who emerged from hiding as the chief approached. But before we can fully appreciate the intense meaning of the exchange that followed, we need to go back and examine another aspect of the Master Chief's character, of John's character. Not long after his physical augmentation in 2525, John was given an opportunity to review his social skills. By his own assessment, he only knew three ways to react to people. If they were his superior officers, he obeyed them. If they were part of his squad, he helped them. If they were a threat, he neutralized them. When alone with the other Spartans, he was reserved. He attributed this emotional inhibition to his teacher, Franklin Mendez, who had impressed on him the importance of tempering camaraderie with the seriousness befitting a commander. This conditioning sometimes made it difficult for John to express even well-earned sentiment, such as when Kurt051 completed his introductory mission on Blue Team in 2531. Serving as a replacement for Samuel034, Kurt proved himself by avoiding an insurrectionist trap set for Blue Team, and then rescuing its other members, including the Master Chief. They fled with a prize of nuclear warheads, and John afterward acknowledged Kurt's gift of intuition, but wanted to say more. John set a hand on Kurt's shoulder, searching for the right words. Kelly, as usual, articulated the sentiments that John never could. She said, Welcome to Blue Spartan. We're going to make a great team. Still, he preferred that his team be at ease to trade jokes and quip with one another. Their combat performance benefited from levity. John, however, struggled with communication that didn't serve a tactical purpose. During Operation Wolf in 2559, he found himself among the reclamation pioneers on Reach, following a botched assault on a banished outpost. While being seen for his injuries, John noticed his doctor was wearing a locket with a picture of her two young sons. He repeatedly tried to inquire about them, but because he was daunted by the idea of asking about someone simply out of his own personal interest, he didn't manage to say anything at first. However, after exhausting everything that he had to discuss with her relevant to Blue Team's mission, he steeled himself to begin the question. He didn't have to finish his sentence before she smiled, and John knew from this that her son still lived. Later, in the midst of a far more successful move against the Banished on Reach, John reflected on his unspoken role in the UNSC. Youthful soldiers idolized him in a way he had not given much thought to until now, and how he responded to that adulation would shape the kind of soldiers they went on to become. 
Now, as hard as it was to accept sometimes, it was he who was the wise old leader, and with that reality came a duty he had never been trained for, and one for which it was probably impossible to be trained, but it was a duty nonetheless. Now prepared with a more complete understanding of the Master Chief, we can return to an exchange of pivotal importance that took place on May 28th, 2560. Chief, my eyes didn't deceive me back there. We need to go. Three UNSC condors. Seeing one is rare. Finding three? It's a miracle. I should have known better. Torn apart. Completely gutted. Sleep space drives obliterated. We don't have the time. Over there's another. Shattered and cratered over a kilometer. In there. The last one. All of it. Crushed. Broken. Beaten. Useless. Enough. When? When is it enough, Chief? When we're in there? Because that's where I belong. In there. With them. Worthless junk. Not this. I'm not you! I'm not a pilot! I'm not even a soldier! A marine! I'm a fraud. I stole that pelican. I stole it! Do you know why? Of course you don't. Have you ever been scared? So scared that you... I'm worthless. You should leave me here with the rest of the carpets. We all fail. We all make mistakes. It's what makes us human. I'm sorry, Chief, but how have you ever failed? I should have protected Cortana. Stopped everything from going wrong. I failed her. I will not fail you. Chief. Wait. We're going to make it. I... We have to. This is all I've got. It's all we need. Our only way home is straight through the heart of the banished. We need you. We can fix this. Together. Of course we can. Together. So? What's the plan? Let me guess. It's dangerous and it's probably going to get us killed. <laughs> I have my answer. Let's do this. This is the coda of 20 years of character growth, the culmination of our journey. Not only does John reach outside himself to console and strengthen someone who's not even a soldier, but also teaches a lesson that he himself hasn't learned, how to deal with failure. Even if John doesn't internalize the lesson he gave to Esparza in the way it applies to himself, he's accomplished something just as significant by helping someone else. But that isn't all. There's something even more noteworthy to be found in the relationship between these two characters. In his confession, Fernando shows that his decision to escape the banished raid without regard for anyone else makes him ashamed. To the extent he acknowledges and grieves his wrongdoing, Fernando's contrition is appropriate. Left to itself, however, it would destroy him. John intervenes, 
and with the weapon's help, persuades him to be the pilot. No more cowardice, and no being cast aside. Because of his honesty, Fernando finds consolation. Chief, I'm sorry about back there. I didn't want to roll, but I, I, I couldn't stay. It's okay. No, oh, it's not okay. It was like I was back there, on the infinity. Once I heard Chief was down, I knew we'd lost. I had to roam. I had to. I found this pelican and just went. I'm sorry. I never looked back. And then, I was on my own. Not anymore. <sighs> you don't know how good that feels. And the chief makes him a promise. These things reinforce him against the suffering that he undergoes at the hands of Jaga Erdomni and Eshram. By the end of the game, Fernando is like a new person, having embraced his life as the pilot. This reclamation of hope is analogous to something in real life. It's what Christ offers to us if we want it. Redemption from our own wrongdoing, removal of our shame, and a promise that endures through times of great hardship.